we're fortunate to have with us Professor Mathieu, who was very much involved in the development of that consensus paper. Professor Mathieu, how have your views and those of your colleagues changed over the last three years? So this consensus paper was really the work of, of 10 people, five Americans and five Europeans who were appointed by ADA and ESD. And we had a task to look at the evidence that was gathered in the last years. So we started off by saying that we acknowledged the position statement of, of 2015, where um, lifestyle interventions were also um, the multifactorial approach of type 2 diabetes and the first line choice of as a pharmaceutical agent metformin was uh, confirmed. So metformin is still there because we have to be very careful when being enthusiastic about all the CVOT trials for instance. All of these trials, all of the newer agents were tested on the background of, of metformin. This consensus paper has a bigger emphasis on, on lifestyle measures. We uh, spent a lot of time looking at the value, for instance, of weight loss therapies like uh, bariatric surgery. And now there's a very clear statement that indeed, in people with diabetes, a BMI above uh, 35 um, uh, kilograms per square meter is an indication for bariatric surgery. We even went as far to say that in people with a BMI above 30, with type 2 diabetes where you have problems despite good lifestyle, despite pharmaceutical agents to control hyperglycemia, that also in these patients bariatric surgery may be considered. Next to bariatric surgery, we also put a lot of emphasis on the uh, potential of specific diets, like the very low calorie diets, but also a lot of emphasis on, on physical activity, on exercise. Exercise, making the muscles move, is crucial, not only in, in reducing hyperglycemia in type 2 diabetes, but also has other effects like blood pressure lowering, beneficial effects on, on lipids. So, if anything, this consensus paper puts more emphasis on, on lifestyle measures than all of the before. And also in that three-year period you just referred to, there have been lots of developments in terms of a new classes of drugs. Where do they fit into the modern treatment of type 2 diabetes? When you look at the position uh, statement that was issued in 2015, um, it, it was more like a menu. It said lifestyle in everybody, metformin in everybody, and then you're on your own. We cannot make any decision on all of the agents. Just look at the side effects of the agents and pick one. Here we were able on the basis of evidence that has been gathered in the meantime to really say that depending on specific characteristics of patients, certain classes of agents should be preferred. One big example is if you have a patient with type 2 diabetes who already has pre-existing cardiovascular disease, then we really now have agents from two classes, namely the SGLT2 inhibitors and the GLP-1 receptor agonist, where we can say if you have cardiovascular disease already present in your patient, if he has an MI, a stroke, then you should have either a GLP-1 receptor agonist or an SGLT2 inhibitor with proven cardiovascular benefit on board. Also, the overwhelming evidence on um, heart failure. All of the studies with the SGLT2 inhibitors in particular have shown a reduction in the hospitalization for heart failure. So there, if you have heart failure present in your patient with type 2 diabetes, then you should prefer an SGLT2 inhibitor. If you have contraindications or if the SGLT2 inhibitor is not tolerated, for instance, genital infections as, as a side effect, then we say we prefer an, a GLP-1 receptor agonist with proven cardiovascular benefit again. And a third group of, of, of people with specific characteristics is in individuals with chronic kidney disease. In people with chronic kidney disease, again, we prefer an SGLT2 inhibitor because all of the studies with the three agents we have in our hands now, empagliflozin, canagliflozin, and dabagliflozin, have uh, indications that there is really an impact on evolution of the renal disease, especially uh, macroalbuminuria.
So there we clearly say SGLT2 inhibitor, but if it's contraindicated or uh, your uh, patient has side effects, then use a GLP-1 receptor agonist. For the busy physician, this sounds quite a complicated series of thoughts about managing the patient in front of him or her. It's extremely simple. If you have cardiovascular disease, pick an SGLT2 inhibitor or GLP-1 receptor agonist. If you have heart failure, pick an SGLT2 inhibitor. If you have renal disease, pick an SGLT2 inhibitor. The issue is, however, that fortunately, more than 80% of our patients with type 2 diabetes do not have cardiovascular disease or do not have renal disease. So in these, what should you do? Is it again a menu? No. Even there, we said that there are patient characteristics where you can look at. So if, for instance, in your patient with type 2 diabetes, avoiding hypoglycemia is the priority, then we say, on top of metformin, pick an agent that doesn't give you hypoglycemic risk, like a DPP-4 inhibitor, a tyrosylidine diode, a GLP-1 receptor agonist, or an SGLT2 inhibitor. If you have a patient where you really want to avoid weight gain or you want to induce weight loss, if that is the priority in your patient, again, we go back to GLP-1 receptor agonists and to SGLT2 inhibitors. And then there's a, a last column in this overview uh, uh, figure, and that says if cost is what is the priority in your patient. Because we do acknowledge that the newer agents are more expensive, and that in many of our healthcare systems, including mine, we're not able to prescribe in many patients some of these newer agents. Does it mean you have to sit back and say, well, you're on your own. If we cannot use the newer agents, we cannot do anything? No. Then we clearly say, use one of the older, cheaper agents, like sulfonylurea, for instance, or like tyrosylidine diones in some countries. But re-intensify education because the whole consensus paper really puts the patient at the center, come to a management plan with the patient and install a good education plan. Education at every step. We also say if you have to use an SU or a TZD, consider using lower doses that might give less of the side effects of these agents and combine them. So we want to give a basis to um, approach the hyperglycemia problem in people with type 2 diabetes, not forgetting that just treating hyperglycemia is not enough. It should be embedded in the whole multifactorial approach, statins, blood pressure control, etc. Professor Mathieu, thank you very much indeed for spending this time with us. My pleasure.